Hello, assalamu alaikum, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, we're, we're pleased to speak to Brother Mas'ud Wahidi. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Mas'ud. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Brother Mas'ud Wahidi is an academic and researcher based in Canada. He studied at the University of Toronto and York University and earned a bachelor's and master's degree, respectively, in the area of political science. As for the Islamic sciences, his main areas of interest lie in the Hadith sciences and Hanbali jurisprudential law, and he has a number of ijazat in these two areas. He has published a number of research articles, which one can access in the link in the description box below. Today, the topic of interest is a paper written by Mas'ud, which pertains to the coffee controversy. It's an article entitled, Coffee Was Once Haram, Dispelling Popular Myths Regarding a Nuanced Legal Issue. Brother Mas'ud will, inshallah, take us through the main themes of this paper and shed light on the most important insights that can be derived from this historical incident. Brother Mas'ud, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much, Brother Bassam. Um, I would like to thank you and Blogging Theology for inviting me on the show. Um, I'm really pleased and uh, excited to uh, share the main insights that I have regarding this topic. Um, this is, you know, might strike a person as being uh, an unnecessary topic, or um, a lot of people question why there is even a need to bring this issue up, which occurred so many centuries ago. But um, I believe that this presentation hopes to critically assess an itch issue, which is uh, often cited as being definitive proof uh, of the intellectual stagnation of the ulama strata. And in many quarters, it is even considered to be a clear manifestation of the closing of the gates of Ijtihad. So I'm referring to what is often called the coffee issue or controversy. And it is a matter of legal interest, which uh, flooded the Muslim world in the 10th century after Hijra or the 16th century CE. And the main topic question that I have is what legal consequences did this uh, controversy have when it arose? So when this issue is studied or when it's presented to us, at least in uh, academic circles or among uh, popular speakers um, in many circles, we have something called a conventional wisdom, which is basically the dominant presentation, a dominant thesis that is uh, given to us. And for this issue in question, the dominant thesis is that the scholars supposedly took a very firm line against it, and they were not very um, attuned to the drink of coffee. The, the, the majority of jurists took a very firm line against it. And they, they will tell you that actually, in fact, the only reason why we're able to drink coffee today in the Muslim world, at least, is because social society, civil society, is what stood up against this scholarly ban and they overturned it. And as a result, we are able to enjoy the freedom of drinking coffee. Had we relied on the scholars exclusively, coffee would have, like, would have likely been still prohibited. So this gives a very you might say a uh, negative impression of the scholarly block as a whole, that scholars, they're not able to um, properly assess, properly uh, react to nawazal, new occurrences, new issues that come in society. It's society that has to uh, adapt to these norms and try to push all of the other sectors of society to go along with it. So this is a very negative picture you know, the majority of jurists took a very firm line against it. Um, there was only a very small circle of scholars that allowed it, but the majority did not allow it. And for that reason, you have a very static retrograde uh, image of the scholarly uh, body. My thesis, though, is very different. It's going to say that actually, if we look at this issue by assessing the primary sources directly, we're going to find that in actual fact, the majority of jurists actually had a very positive impression of coffee or a neutral impression of it. And they believe that actually coffee um, poses no social or moral ills in and of itself. 
And as a reason, it is actually, it's permissible to be con consumed. And uh, there is no issue with somebody to drink it from an Islamic standpoint. Um, in addition, my presentation, it assesses um, an important rejoinder to an evidence that's often cited by the um, conventional wisdom. And they, what they usually say is that there's actually evidence that most scholars oppose coffee in what is called the Meccan assembly, which I'll talk about later. Um, I will show that the Meccan assembly actually does not prove that the majority of scholars or all of them were against coffee. In actual fact, it proves that um, mo no prohibition could actually be supported through a scholarly or legal standpoint, um, which we'll show inshallah at the end of this presentation today. So the alternative thesis um, does not just say, my alternative thesis does not just say that um, the majority of jurists um, permitted coffee. I also look at across the spectrum and I'm trying to assess whether there were other variant positions. And I showed that, yeah, there are some divergences. You will find a smaller cluster of scholars who sometimes they, they might shift a bit from the view of permissibility by sometimes saying that coffee is disliked or even some saying that it's recommended according to one particular legal uh, point of view. And there is a minority of scholars, of, of course, that I do, uh, I do acknowledge that there is a minority of scholars that do prohibit coffee. But um, what I do want to point out or show is that many of these positions of prohibition, which are often pointed out, do not actually give us an unconditionally um, prescribing view of this drink. So in fact, if we look at this, we're going to actually notice that some of these um, answers from these prohibitionists, the prohibiting jurists, they're actually quite qualified by a number of provisions or the scholar in, in question actually did not give a definitive ruling on the topic. They only based their answer based on what the questioner told them. So if these, if these points are right, we're actually going to challenge this conventional wisdom, the mainstream wisdom, which says that the majority of jurors pro prohibited coffee. I'm saying that actually it's the other way around. And it's not society per se that um, allowed us to drink coffee. We, cannot, we must actually give a lot of credit to jurists themselves. So that is my uh, alternative thesis. It puts the mainstream wisdom on its head. So we can now, we're going to go across the spectrum now today and trying to um, give a bit of, um, you know, a bit of assessment, a bit of a, a bit of a, a bird's eye view of these various legal views. So starting with the first view, we're going to look at something called the um, position of normative desirability. And that's just saying, what I'm just trying to say is that, um, the, there were a few scholars, in fact, who believed coffee is a recommended substance in a way. Now, that does sound a bit weird, but what I mean by this is that we're going to find some scholars who believed coffee was either a blessed beverage or was a beverage that could be you. It was conducive to performing good actions. So, so when, you say norm, when you say normative desirability, you mean mustahab recommended? Yeah, we could say that. Yeah, to, yeah. Um, there will be some scholars who actually do say that. Um, mm. And um, I will uh, point that out. What, um, but the Sufi, uh, but one thing that I'm trying to say is that there are some, um, it, it is interesting to find that there were a large cluster of Sufi scholars who believed that there was something significant about coffee, that it was a type of um, divine assistance from Allah Azzawajal, a type of substance that could be used in a very positive manner. Um, now, that might sound weird, but what I mean by this is that if we look at um, religious ascetics in the past, they, they were very devoted to um, worship. They believed they wanted to maximize their worship during the nighttime. And the issue was, is there a permissible way to do this? So there were some figures who use some problematic or we might say um, legally, morally problematic substances, or some had to go through very onerous tasks. Like for example, it's narrated that um, a Shibli, one of the Sufi ascetics, he would actually put salt on his eyes to stay awake. So oh, yeah. <laughs> now 
with coffee found, you have yeah. something completely that could raise your alertness to an unforeseen level. It gives you an overall um, increased level of energy levels for acts of worship. Um, yeah, without any apparent immediate cause of self-harm. Yeah, so it was um, removing all, you, they were able to sidestep all the problems that they had in the previous substances that were being used. Because the great benefit found in coffee was that it, it, um, it inhibited sleep. And so it allowed Sufis to devote the whole night in worship by performing their litanies and prayers. And of course, because many of the first consumers of coffee were devoted worshipers, it is no matter of surprise to find that the drink was deemed as being normatively desirable. So it is interesting to note that according to many historians, the Sufis are credited as being the discoverers and users of coffee, if you look at the history of it. Um, though unfortunately today I don't have, um, it's not my area of discussion today, but the general, the, because the energy and vitality generated by coffee was being used for exclusively religious ends by a limited number of users during the mm. early years of coffee's discovery, conferring the drink with the ruling of recommendation was hardly a matter of surprise. So the view of normative desirability, it makes sense in the regard that when coffee is first being discovered, it is being used in an, a res few restricted quarters. It hasn't, you might say, it hasn't spread to the major cities yet. It is only in some places like Yemen. And it's only being exclusively used by Sufi ascetics, scholars, religiously scrupulous people. And of course, these types of users, their only mind is on worship and um, doing uh, acts of prayer, performing litanies. And for that reason, anything that ex maximizes that number is going to take its ruling. So um, it is going to help you perform that end. So we're going to use um, we're going to use it for that end. So we can say that it's recommended. Some jurists they actually did appreciate this perspective and they also gave it, they, they, they said that, yes, we're going to also extend this and say that it is recommended. And um, you can find that view cited by some scholars. It's mentioned by Al-Tabandawi, uh, Sheikh Al-Muzajjad. Um, they do mention some principles on that regard, um, but mostly this type of normal desirability, it comes from the early Sufi scholars. Um, so, yeah, and that, that is what is pointed out by some researchers as well and historians. But the most important um, perspective and position, I would say, especially from a fiqhi standpoint, it comes from the scholars who are looking at it from a permissibility perspective. And why is it important? It's because among the five point hierarchy of religious rulings, the majority position concerning coffee was that of its permissibility. And the jurists, we're not talking about religious ascetics who are just looking at the end of worship. The jurists are looking at things more from a technical legal standpoint. And their research objective is very different. They are looking at this topic much more or less to appraising the positive qualities. And instead, they are concentrating their efforts on, rebute, on refuting scholars who argued for its prohibition. So scholars who were trying to do this they were in a tug of war type of position with scholars who were prohibiting coffee. Now, when you're in that type of a situation, you need to construct the strongest legal arguments possible. You cannot simply rely on the principle of original permissibility, saying that oh, the the origin the the, the default ruling of things and substances is that they're permissible unless there is another uh, evidence that comes against it. They can't just rely on that because you have um, other scholars who are saying, well, look, I've heard from some people that coffee is intoxicating. The name Qahwa in Arabic was used as a descriptor of wine. It was used synonymously with wine and poetry in the past. So there is some kind of an association, at least prima, fa prima facie, which gives mm. me some type of grounds to uh, have doubt on this. So you can't just rely on a simple piece of evidence like al-ibaha al-asliya. So what happens then? What happens is that the permitting side, they had to resort to arguments that were epistemically weightier and stronger than the ones produced by the permitting side. And the main piece of evidence used for justifying the permissibility of coffee was by appealing to the process of experimentation. And this is known as a tajriba. 
A tajriba, unlike witness testimony, unlike witness testimony, experimentation is a source of certain and iron clad knowledge. So like, for example, a Sheikh uh, Al Jaziri, who's one of the main scholars of uh, coffee, he says that a tajriba is one of the sources of certain knowledge. It gives a certain and iron clad knowledge. The reason for that is because once you directly consume a substance multiple times, um, you are actually able to discern its side effects and what kind of properties can be discerned with certainty. So epistemically speaking, the findings that are yielded through direct sensory perception are far stronger than anything that may be deduced through secondary channels, such as witness testimony or analogy. And that's because witness testimony only gives something called ghalabatadhan, while experimentation provides absolute certainty. Um, so yeah, there are a number of scholars who use this method. Um, so for example, Zakaria Lansari, he's one of the main scholars who did this. Um, Muhammad Ibn Ilyas Al-Hanafi is another scholar who did it. Um, and it's also invoked by a number of other scholars like um, Ahmed Ibn At-Tayyib Al-Tabandawi, um, one scholar who I haven't given the biography for, <laughs> Nuruddin Ibn Ali. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> Masar Shafi'i and Ibn Hajar Al-Haythami. Yeah, so uh, so I mean, uh, what I call us to see is that this process of experimentation is not just recognized in one particular madhab. It seems like you have Hanafis there, you got Shafi'is there, so it seems like it, you know, it, it's something that's recognized by jurists uh, across the board. Yeah, it is something that you'll find discussed in books of logic as well. Um, Sheikh Abdul Sheikh Al Jaziri is also another scholar who talks about it. Um, it is something that's discussed by Sheikh Abdul Ghani and Nabulsi. A famous Hanafi scholar. So you have scholars across the board, and Sheikh Al Jazeera is Hanbali, by the way. So, so you have scholars from multiple madhabs, all talking about the superior epistemic warrant found in experimentation. Mm. Um, and because of that, it's no surprise to find that several scholars who permitted coffee relied on it as a means of refuting the evidence produced by the prohibiting side. Mm. So, looking at these examples just a bit in more in detail. Perhaps one of the most vivid illustrations of the use of this procedure can be found in the case of the leading Shafi jurist, Zakaria Lansari. Ansari, he ran an experiment known as an ikhtabar through where he could actually discern the effects of coffee directly. So what do we mean by experimentation? What did he do? What he did was he actually had a, a group of guests over and what he did was he actually prepared for them coffee and he then presented it to all of them and he ordered them to all, for all of them to consume it and after waiting for some time to pass he started a conversation with them he started speaking with them he started to you know try to, to you know look at their responses can they respond effectively and quickly are they able to speak properly anymore what's going on is there are, can we detect any changes in their speaking patterns um, their comprehension or ability to speak has had, has it been compromised. And he did this multiple times. He, he checked after an hour, he checked up on them again. He found no unusual changes in them. And then he actually repeated the process again. He made more coffee. He increased the amount. And he then again, once again spoke with them. So after doing this a few times, he actually was able to firmly um, come to the conclusion that coffee is not intoxicant. And Ansari ruled that the coffee was permissible. And he is even um, recorded to have written a pamphlet or a work on this topic. Now, besides Ansari, we have another scholar who also ran a meticulous experiment. And this is done by the Kyrene jurist and chief judge, Muhammad bin Ilyas Al-Hanafi. So the context of um, Al-Hanafi's uh, experimentation is interesting because it occurs in the context of a serious debate on when on the permissibility of coffee. And he's he finds himself um, summoned in the midst of this polarized debate. And it's because you during this time in Cairo, there was some violence occurring between the two sides. So there was some serious uh, back and forth occurring between the permitting side and the prohibiting side. And in the midst of this, Muhammad bin Ilyas al Hanafi's asked, he's like, he said, you have to, as your capacity as the grand judge of Cairo, to intervene and resolve this 
deadlock that's occurring. So what did he do? He said, we, we need to find a definitive answer to this topic. And he also resorted to the procedure of experimentation. And he ensured that coffee was prepared in his residence. He had a number of attendees sit in his house. He conversed with them for almost a whole day, giving them coffee throughout this time process. And he wanted to probe their state of mind to see if any type of changes could be detected. And it's even said that he, he not only repeated the process, he even started drinking coffee himself to see what was going on. And after not observing any like effects or changes, he then concluded that coffee's consumption was illicit. The other scholars who are listed here, they did not run experiments by themselves, like Tabandawi, um, Nuruddin Ali, Ibn Nasr Shafi, Ibn Hajar al Haytham. They did not run experiments themselves. But what they did do was they were relying on the same types of indicators, these types of these types of epistemic indicators. Um, it is it does still fall under the broad heading of experimentation in the sense that they were observing society around them as careful actors. They were looking at coffee drinkers, for example, in society. They would say, we've, we've looked at coffee drinkers for a long time, and we don't think that they look like um, alcoholics or people who are addicted to drugs. They don't look like, they don't appear in any sense like those people. So for that reason, they're saying we can't deduce that coffee is an intoxicant or harmful to the intellect and body. So. They were looking, they were saying that, yeah, these, these are empirical findings that are justified through the external senses and perception. And these types of indicators, when we look at society around us empirically, and we find that there is no type of uh, trance or no type of um, intoxication, this demonstrates that any supposed analogy that a prohibiting scholar tries to make between coffee and other intoxicants is fallacious because direct sensory experience reveals a number of intrinsic differences between coffee and opioids, which bars the invocation of any type of analogy. And they were actually saying that, you know, our, our analysis and our, um, our observ observation shows that rather the case is the opposite. So for example, um, um, Ali ibn Nasr al-Shafi, he was saying that when I look at scholar, when I look at coffee drinkers, I notice that they're actually, they become more energetic. They are less lazy. They are more prone to doing, they're more prone to productivity. Whereas yeah. drugs, they befuddle the mind. They impede one's ability to speak properly. They cause a person to be, become very lazy, you might say. But coffee, they say it vitalizes the mind and body. So that's what they're saying in, in their assessment on this topic. Great. Now, is the permissibility view majoritarian? So what we've done so far is we've looked at some of the permitting scholars. We've looked at some of them. But now the question is, what evidence, if any, is there to um, support the thesis that the majority of permitting scholars were were, were for coffee, how are we to deduce that the permitting side is the majority side? Why not just say that it's a minority opinion or it's just one of the many small opinions? Um, so what is there evidence for that? So there are some indicators which we can use to deduce that coffee is the permitting side on coffee was the majority view. So perhaps one of the strongest pieces of evidence is the fact that unanimous consensus was often cited by scholars in favor of the permitting side. Of course, there is no doubt that invocations of consensus are often um, exaggerated or they fall short. And there are sometimes dissenting voices that are not taken into account. Um, no, no doubt about that. But without, um, without contesting that view, one should at the same time acknowledge that many of these citations can still be employed as evidence that there is a majority out there that is deeming coffee to be permissible. Why is that the case? That is because no scholar or no scrupulous jurist would make such a blanket statement or type of strong assessment without having access to some wide ranging declarations from scholars beforehand. 
they must have some type of sufficient epistemic warrant, which gave them the confidence to make that type of declaration. So there must be a strong majority, uh, a strong body of scholars who's doing this or, or pointing to this. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, because uh, it's, it's, you know, for someone to take a minority position and say, well, actually, there's an ijma supporting this, it, it's such an easily falsifiable claim, right? Yeah. And it, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, you're, you looked into this, but those that did claim um, it was ijma, I don't think there were, we have any documented responses to them saying, what do you, what on earth are you guys talking about? Your view is the minority view. This is a radically, uh, radically, radically absurd claim for you to make. I don't think we have any of that, any of that documented, right? In terms of prohibiting scholars, I don't think any one of them would say that or, or had the confidence to say such a claim. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing they could say was that um, we, they were saying we have we have a strong presupposition that coffee is harmful or intoxicating because we've had people come to us and say that they've had effects. Now, why would witnesses do that? That's another topic, but we do have his, you know, historical data that points to the fact that witnesses do lie sometimes. They have certain incentives to do that. Sometimes they will lie because they want to. Uh, they want to show as if they they have changed their path, their past, and they are now trying to become more uh, morally scrupulous. So they will try to you know, present themselves as a, as a reformed person. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's trying to create a moral impression of yourself. Sometimes they, people did do things like that. It's not surprising. Um, so yeah, you know, we, we yeah. do find the, the citation con unanimous consensus are coming only from the permitting side. So that this, that this gives you some kind of confidence that something is being said or something is going uh, on. It's, it's definitely a very, uh, at, at the very least, a very strong circumstantial argument, at the very least. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's definitely true. I would agree with that, yeah. Um, the other thing to note is that you had a number of very prominent jurists, arguably you could say more prominent jurists on the permitting side, as opposed to the prohibiting side. So for example, Sheikh Zakaria Lansari, no, uh, like any anybody who has a, knows a bit about Shafi jurisprudence, they will know that what yeah. important position he had and how many students he had. And it was many of his students who circulated his permitting opinion of coffee around many parts of the Islamic world, which gave the permitting view much more strong weight. Um, you have some scholars who mention uh, the names of other important figures who played an important role in um, boosting coffee's reception. And they were able to do this through a number of devices. So the two main devices that were used is First of all, the, the device of debates. A lot of permitting scholars like Abu al-Fath al-Maliki, they use the device of a debate in order to defeat the opponents that were prohibiting coffee and show the arguments of the permitting side. So Abu al-Fath al-Maliki, a very important jurist, one of the scholars who very vocally was on the permitting side, he actually participated in a number of debates. He won. He actually defeated his opponents in them. He had a very famous one in Damascus in the presence of the chief judge of Damascus. He also um, was a very, um, a very skilled poet, and he actually uh, composed many verses of poetry demonstrating the permissibility of coffee. Um, Zain al-Abidin al-Bakri, he's also mentioned in some, uh, in some pamphlets or works of poetry. And of course, he, I, I believe, is also noted as being an important Kyrene uh, justice. So you have a number of figures here, all of them having uh, occupying certain senior positions, um, very important and vocal scholars um, participating in debates in civil society, and they're able to... Um, or they were very outstanding jurists who had an, a large number of students. And through these different types of measures where it, it doesn't really become a surprise of why the permitting view would have so much traction. So um, it does make more sense to see this. For example, on the, on the permitting side, on the other hand, you do have some names that are not very well known or they're not as prominent or some of them even um, were ridiculed um, I'd rather not mention them because um, yeah. sometimes, sometimes the ridiculing does get a bit harsh. 
Um, but there is um, there are some cases and stories mentioned in uh, Al Jazeera's work um, showing how some prohibiting scholars were did not have that much of a reception. They didn't enjoy that type of um, legitimacy among their students or their peers to the extent that their opinion would be given much weight. And on the other hand, they were actually sometimes even subject to mockery and ridicule even. So mm. again, showing the weakness of the prohibiting side. Now, there is another interesting position, which kind of, it falls in between the permitting view and the prohibiting view. And this is the position of deeming coffee morally disliked. Now, cool. remember when, sorry, did the, you have mean, uh, Yeah, the, uh, so when you say morally disliked, uh, we mean makru, right? Yes, thank you, yeah. Um, you can do you can do the Arabic stuff. I'm. Uh, I'll, no, no, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just for you know, just to. No, no thank you. Yeah. The, a lot of the <laughs> listeners would know haram, makruh, mubah. So, but yeah, it's great. That's great. What we're that, talking about. Yeah, that um, it's a, it's a lapse on my part not to bring the uh, Arabic terms. I should have done that. Um, but no. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to note that coffee was once restricted to very religious, religiously vocal circles, religiously conscious circles, like the Sufis that we mentioned in the beginning. And in that, in that, in that respect, it was used as a source of religious vitality for religious worship. But over time, what happens is once it spreads to the major cities, it now becomes a vehicle for amusement. And one of the main corollaries of coffee that, that emerges once it goes into the major cities in the Muslim world is that you have something called the coffee house. And the coffee house is, it becomes a very problematic place in the minds of many jurists. And um, one of the main problems that comes up there is that it was a place for um, intermingling of the genders. There was usually sometimes music. Sometimes people are drinking alcohol. There was chess. There was backgammon. Um, there was something called idara, where they were drinking coffee in a way that was similar to how wine drinkers would consume coffee. So there were some very negative. There were many negative associative factors that were coming up. And in the view of many jurists, a person who was associating themselves with the drink coffee or even consuming it, they were putting themselves in bad company, even if they did not intend it. You're mm -hmm. drinking something that's becoming kind of the the major symbol of religious moral looseness so mm. a lot of jurists were saying why would you want to uh, you know draw any type of link or association we're not saying there's a causal link between coffee and um you know being a morally problematic person but we're saying that these jurists were saying that you're putting yourself in bad company you should protect your standing and uprightness as a Muslim and try to um, refrain from these types of actions. So you have some jurists who mention these types of opinions. Perhaps the most famous is, um, you, you have a number of scholars actually, some of them saying that, um, some of them were saying that, like for example, Abu Saud al-Afendi, for instance, he's one famous scholar who talks about this. Um, he says that whatever the, people of evil are accustomed to doing it does not befit somebody of you know of proper standing to um partake in something to that effect he says in one of his fatwas so you have this position saying that you have to be very careful you should not um put, associate yourselves with this so this position actually did have some popularity it was um mentioned by a number of jurists um, and their legal reasoning um, is fairly apparent. But they, it's interesting that despite them talking about the negative associative factors, they were, they were um, careful to stress that they were not giving a, an opinion on the inherent properties of coffee. They're not saying that it's prohibited in and of itself. They're saying that we're looking at the outside factors that are commonly intermingling with coffee so because of this common mixture, we are now going to have to be very wary of this. So, you know, some scholars, they might say certain religious gatherings or sittings in certain places might, or certain contexts are okay. But they say, but now when we see a lot of morally problematic things happening in them, we're going to start to be more careful about them. 
like as an example, sometimes you do see that happening. Um, then you have something called the, the prohibitionist view, which usually is the first opinion that comes up and mentioned in many places, but now you, in this um, lecture, we're actually looking at it the other way around. Now, the prohibitionist view, a few things that, a few important things to mention is that the first important thing to mention is that um, there are, without any doubt, some scholars who were prohibitionists, you know, there are, it is documented that some scholars were firm prohibitionists. But an important thing to know is that the lists that we are often presented with are sometimes quite inflated, arguably. We cannot with firm certainty say that all of the scholars who are deemed to be fervent opponents of coffee are, were in fact opposed to the, the drink in fully and unquestionably. We can't say that. And the reason for that is because context matters. You know, simply put, when we, when we look at these answers, we have to note that they're fatwas most of the times. Most of these answers that we're being presented with, they're religious verdicts that were being posed to them by certain questioners. Now, when you look at these answers, one cannot, one cannot and should not just look at the answer being provided. One has to also look at the question itself and how is the question being posed to them? What is being told to them? This is an important um, jurisprudential principle that's given in the um, area of answering verdicts. And the reason why we have to look at the question is because the jurist consult, the person who's giving the answer, the mufti, he has to depend on the information provided to them. There is a firm connection thus between how the questioner's query is worded and the type of response that is ultimately issued by the scholar that is answering. And this nexus is often articulated through an important principle, which is known as al-mufti asir al-mustafti. It's the principle that the jurist consult is the prisoner of the questioner. And essentially, this axiom, it embodies an important convention that the jurist consult's response must be in proportion to and correspond to the information provided by the questioner and not go beyond it. And in fact, there are some scholars who say that this principle is so strong and firm in its, uh, in its force that the jurist who's answering has to actually respond exactly based on what the questioner says, even if they believe that the information provided does not fully correspond to reality. So these types of conventions and the force that they have on these scholars who are answering and giving supposedly or apparently prohibiting answers, they actually give us a completely different um, perspective. And that's because when we look at these questions, we'll notice that many of the jurists who supposedly deemed coffee to be prohibited, they formulated their answers in response to questions that had some very inaccurate or even blatantly false um, points of information regarding coffee. So a hasty observer is just gonna look at the answer and be like, oh, look, they said it's prohibited. But if you look at the question, you're gonna say, well, did these jurists really have a point, like a, a chance to say anything else besides prohibition? Mm. The second look tells us that the text of many of these questions had um, very problematic points of information. They were saying that coffee is harmful to the mind, harmful to the body, coffee is an intoxicant. They were saying that coffee drinkers, they don't work, they don't do this. They're morally problematic people they go to sinful settings, they do this, they do that. So nothing positive mentioned about coffee. So with, with, with such a one-sided and misleading de description of the drink, especially when you're telling people that coffee is an intoxicant, um, it's causing these types of problems to the mind. These jurists really didn't have a choice. They couldn't really give us a positive response on coffee. They, and they, were, they would say, okay, well, if this, you know, I haven't seen coffee, but if this is how you're describing it and you're saying to me that it's like this, then, if that's the case, then it's prohibited. Now, something important though, is that 
these jurists, they couldn't say coffee is permitted based on the conven convention of al-Mufti, al-Sir, al-Mustafti. But interestingly, many of these jurists were very vigilant in their replies. They, they ensured that their answers were qualified. And perhaps the most important thing is that they would render their questions in the conditional sense. So they would say, they would meticulously phrase their answers by saying that if you can establish that coffee indeed intoxicates, then the ruling of prohibition is warranted. So the use of the conditional sentence structure has a lot of importance in legal quarters since it only brings forth a qualified answer. So because this has an inference to it, the inferred understanding from such a response is that if coffee does not intoxicate, then it should actually be deemed permissible. So if you take the wording of the question into account, one cannot actually conclude that these jurists were firm prohibitionists. In fact, you might say that if these jurists were given the rightful pieces of information, they might have actually been neutral about coffee, like, okay, it's permitted. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have this important um, quotation or citation from Al Jaziri. And what he's saying is that he gives us a number of um, answers from fatwas, from scholars, saying that all of them are saying if it's like this, when it is like this, if it's established to be like this, then it's prohibited. So he's giving a, he gave a number of conditional responses from scholars, and he said that when you look at these fatwas, you will see that actually they put all of the um, they shift all of the burden on the questioner, saying that you are held to account. You know, so mm -hmm. this is known as a he said it's it's ta'liq al-hukum ala sihat al was which comes from the questioner. So mm. they're 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 shifting the burden of responsibility on the description that's provided by the questioner, saying that you hold the responsibility for what you said. If you're right, then okay, it's prohibited. If you're not right, then okay, you you turn out to be lying. And our mm. wrong answer, if it's wrong, it's based on the misleading information you've provided. So mm. so Al Jaziri says. You can't really benefit from these answers and say that these coffee these scholars were prohibitionists. So, yeah, he's giving this an important um, legalistic reading of these fatwas. And I think we could only speculate as to what was going on there with the questioners themselves, right? Like, were they sincerely mistaken when they framed these questions, or was there some kind of, I don't know, hidden agenda? Uh, I guess we can't. We can only speculate, but uh, as you said, uh, you know, the if these scholars themselves did not do um, these experiments like how other scholars have have done, um, I, I guess the only thing they could do is rely on the, the question and how it's framed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the point about the questioners it's kind of it's very fascinating um, in the sense that. We can't, of course, make some firm uh, conclusions on them, but Sheikh um, uh, Abdul Ghani al Nabuls, he's a famous scho a Hanafi scholar who um, has some important points about um, why these types of things occur. He said that um, he said that it's often the case that prohibitionists of certain substances they're usually more morally cautious. Um, they usually have they they want to take a harder stance, and sometimes they're on the minority side. And he says as a tactic to boost their numbers, what they'll do is they or they or they will take other people on board and they will try to pose misleading questions and procure fatwas of prohibition from other scholars and that way they'll be able to boost their numbers, at least mm -hmm. apparently. So it's a type of tactic to you use to in order to improve your, you know, your numbers, so to speak, and then try to improve your vision your your reception in the minds of people assessing the debate. So now people are looking at it be like will be like, oh, looks more like a closer to parity type of position. We the two sides are fairly more or less balanced. So mm, mm, mm. Yeah, they look at, they're looking at they're looking at the final result. What did he say? Yeah. Haram, Macru, recommended. Yeah. You know, uh, and and, that, and that's what a lot of people tend to do. And they they tend to ignore the details uh that are there within the fatwa. And, and, and honestly, I mean, I don't want to digress, but I've, you know, even raised this issue on, on separate subjects where people would appeal. I don't want to digress too much. I'm just giving one very quick example. No, so go when, ahead, it comes, no, no, no. When, it, when it comes to, you know, Muslims living in the West, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people would say, oh, well, you know, the majority of scholars 
said it's it's permissible. Mm -hmm. But they, they ignore all the conditions that scholars attach when they say that, right? I, I don't want to digress. Uh, oh, no, that's uh, great. That, but but it's, it's, it's something that goes on till today, right? No, I think people, that's a great example. People would say, uh, even when we're talking about Islamic finance, when we're talking about they, you know, oh, yeah, this sheikh said that it's perfectly fine to take, a, you know, so-and-so loan. This sheikh said it's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. And they're looking at the final answer. And they fail to look at the question and the way it's been worded and whether that specific country or that specific bank applies to the same bank that he's inquiring about or, or the country that he lives in and whatnot. So this is an ongoing problem. And what you're highlighting is just, some, is just one, of the, uh, is one of the cases which that occurs. Oh, that's great. I, I think those examples are really good because they, uh, um, they're, I think they're much more relevant, especially in modern circles mm -hmm. as opposed to mm -hmm. today. Um, yeah, but exactly, Sheikh Abdul Ghani and Napulsi, he says that any um, any fatwa that you're looking at, and there's when you when you when you see these types of rulings, you have to be very careful in uh, assessing the question as well, and assessing the exact wording of the question as well, because if they're if they're wording it in a con wording it in a conditional manner, then they're essentially telling you if if they're saying if 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 X then Y, then they're saying if if it's not X, then it's not Y. It's not the, the same ruling does not apply. So yeah. you some people just look at the effect or the consequence side and are saying, oh, it's just Y, just Y continuously. But they're not mm -hmm. looking at that first part, the conditional sense. So mm -hmm. they're just looking at the effect side. They're not looking at the cause. Um, an interesting thing to note is that um, this type of conditional reading and this type of... Um, provisional answer can even be detected in the most firmest of prohibitionists. So when, when we talk about prohibitionists of coffee, probably the most famous name that comes up is uh, Sheikh Abdul Haq uh, Sumbati. The most, he's the most prevalent name. He's the most cited name. He's brought up everywhere. Uh, Sumbati is the name that's always brought up. Now the question is, as, is it Sumbati a prohibitionist? Well, in some of his answers, when you look at them, yeah, they are fairly explicit, but you'll find that there's actually a strong degree of discussion even on his view of it. So, for example, on in one of his answers, and this is cited by uh, a Sheikh al-Jaziri, he's not the one saying this, he's citing another scholar who is reading it. Um, it was a side discussion. It's all... Um, this other scholar, he's saying, when I look at a, a Sumbati's answers, I actually find that some of them are conditional. So he says, in, in one of his answers, he says, if coffee is intoxicating, then it is deemed as impure and then it is prohibited. But the, the answer, the, the answer's wording, it's conditional clauses, show that if the cause turns out to be non-existent, i.e. intoxication or impurity or whatever, then the consequent ruling will also cease to exist as well. So some scholars are saying even a Sumbati's answers do not give us the license to deem him to be a prohibitionist. This is fascinating because if we apply this test to a number of the fatwas that are cited for scholars who are deemed to be quote unquote prohibitionists, if we apply the same test, we're actually going to find that the same result is going to be found, that their, most of their answers are conditional. And they're saying that those, those um, presumed causes turn out to be untrue. And for that reason, we can't continue to hold on to them. So what does this mean? It means the number of prohibitionists are going to decrease substantially. Exactly. The number of true prohibitionists. Yeah, because even if you think about it, and thinking about it from the perspective of the jurist himself, Right. Uh, uh, if we have just a very basic understanding of of the usul and maxims that jurists work with uh, in their respective madhabs, and we then let us assume that someone framed the question correctly to them. Look, there's this drink called coffee. It increases vitality. It gives you an energy boost. It does not cause you to get drunk. It does not make you lazy. It does not have any of these associated harms. What is the hukum of it? Now, put, let's put ourselves in their shoes and think on what possible basis, get, you know, uh, given the maxims that they typically uh, work with, would they even declare it to be haram, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, uh, you know, it, it, and, and I guess that, that's the way we should be looking at it. Um, and uh, uh, because 
you know, you can't expect every single scholar to engage in the sort of experimentation that, you know, uh, Imam Zakaria al-Ansari engaged in, right? Because they're also busy dealing with thousands of other nawazil and, so, and, and, and so many other issues, right? And they're probably engaging in experiments in those issues, though. So you can't have a scholar who is a full-fledged expert on every single Nazi or on every single newly arising issue. And so these sorts of conditional responses are, um, uh, are, are necessary and are expected. And it is up to the God-fearing person who is reading these, the fatwa uh, to, to, to appreciate that and to make sure that he's not just skipping to the, to the final answer and actually reading the entire answer. I think that's a, the the points you brought up are very fascinating. I think the most important one is the the one you said that about um, if you mention a positive or just give a neutral account of coffee, scholars are going to permit it. And I thought that was interesting because if you read Al Jazeera's book, he actually this is Al Jazeera's book. It's um, it's the most famous book, Umda the Safwa fi Hill al Qahwa. This is a book mm -hmm. by Al Jazeera. He he actually. Um, it's a full-fledged account of the history of coffee and um, the legal debates concerning it. And he cites the questions that were given for mm. these fatwas. Now, it's interesting that you, taught, you, you brought up the issue about the neutral rulings, uh, the neutral questions, because if you look at the answers that are given that are positive for coffee or permitting, that they say, oh, it's permissible, the questions mm. are framed in a very, in that type of uh, proper manner, the way you, mm. frame, you know, coffee, this is the drink we People drink it. It gives this type of energy. Um, is this okay? Is this intoxication? It gives energy. It doesn't stunt the mind. Um, people are more productive. It gives this type of energy. Not, there, not, not nothing misleading. Then these scholars say, "Yeah, it's okay. It's fine." Yeah. So there's a clear cut, direct cor correlation. So if we were to like make a table and bring all the fatawas of prohibiting it uh, on one side, and the questions that were asked that you know, that, that kind of, um, you know, uh, provoked that, that, that prohibition and then got all the fatawa that permitted it and got the questions that, you know, uh, provoked those, those fatawa, we would see a, a clear distinction between the questions that were asked. Forget the mm -hmm. answer, but yeah. the actual questions. So, so yeah, there's a clear cut direct correlation, I guess. The question I to ask you, Masoud, uh, sorry for interrupting, but no, no. Um, I, I know you, uh, you're, you're talking about the, the jurist that, uh, permitted it, and we saw that you know there were Ahnaf, there were Hanabila, there were Shafi's, so it wasn't um, kind of um, uh, uh, interlinked with a particular madhab. But when it came to the prohibitionist view, um, do you feel that there was any kind of connection with a certain madhab and the prohibitionist view? Like, did you see that? Were you real? Did you realize that? Oh, maybe the Hanabila, or maybe the um, Malikis were more prone to uh, declaring it uh, haram, or you didn't observe any sort of correlation between the two. Oh, that's a that's a fascinating question. To be so, to be honest, um, um, to first answer it in terms of the permitting scholars, I would say that um, most of the scholars that you come across on the permitting side are from the the Shafi'i scholars. That kind of makes sense because, um, you know, you had a lot of Shafi'i scholars in the Hijaz and a lot of these areas where coffee was spreading. Um, you also had a lot of um, major prime, prime, prominent Kyrene jurists who were also of the Shafi'i Madhab who were permitting it. And so that's not um, the shocking part, but in terms of the prohibiting jurists, I don't necessarily see a lot of a, uh, correlation per se um and that's even if you do see them as prohibitionists now the interesting thing is that you do have um this memorandum which is sent to some scholars in cairo and it's the question was misleading of course it's not it's a misleading question and the scholars who were all um prohibiting it or giving these conditional answers of prohibition they were from uh the various methods there wasn't anything that suggested that because they're all being told it's intoxicating right so they're yeah, like yeah. they're all just saying okay yeah if it's intoxicating okay so i guess like, the, the, the the primary determinant factor here in influencing the fatwa was the nature of the question itself yeah and the level of 
knowledge that the respective scholar in question had directly of of coffee. Otherwise, there's nothing particular about the usul um, uh, uh, about uh, 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 of a particular juristic school that would have made it more prone to prohibiting uh, coffee if understood correctly. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's what I was trying to get, drive at. I guess. Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily see much of a. Uh any type of uh, disparity in the the prohibit the prohibition prohibiting voices because they're all just being uh, given this um, they're giving they're giving the most uh, the most strong of claims against it the most strong of uh, prohibitory factors are being alleged in their in their questions so they're kind of forced to uh, they're they're pushed to a corner and they're going to be like okay yeah. if that's the case then uh, we really can't do much about it so great. Um, interesting question. <laughs> I, I might have to look back into that, but right now, um, right now I can't see anything come up. Um, yeah. <laughs> interesting question. Um, the last topic to discuss today is the, um, the Meccan assembly. So the Meccan assembly, it's one of the most important episodes, which is cited to supposedly demonstrate um, the claim that coffee was deemed prohibited by the majority of scholars. So this famous assembly occurs in 917 after Hijra, uh, corresponding to 1511 CE. And in this famous meeting of several senior jurists convened by the Meccan governor, the written approval of all major scholars of the city was obtained for the ban of the drink. So yeah, this happened as a fact. You have these all these scholars saying, okay, yeah, we agree. Coffee is prohibited. They did, they did that, 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 that happened. It's true. But if we look at the, um, the background of the events, we'll notice that these answers that are being given, they're not consensual per se. They were not actually um, issued by these jurists through their own will. They were actually in more or less um, obtained through force. Um, so the standard narrative is telling us that, oh, no, all these scholars agree on it. Well, the real thing to say is actually, is this really the case? Is it really the case that this was a mutually agreed upon determination by all these scholars? Um, standard, standard narrative is looking at the consequence. They're saying, yeah, all these scholars wrote this, which is true. It's true. They did that. But did they actually agree on it? The standard narrative as Al Jazeera points out, is quite faulty because it hides and conceals many of the tensions that were found within the trial or the Meccan assemb the assembly itself. Uh, and Al Jazeera, he does a, like you might say, a, a proper step-by-step um, -step assessment of the historical background of this. And what he tells us is what, what occurred was you had a few small a small group of chauvinistic jurists jurists who had a very strong um position against coffee who banded together with a few doctors who also did not like coffee uh we can presume why there are a few reasons why they all sat together they said we're all going to go to the meccan governor and we're going to convince him that the coffee this coffee is a, a terrible substance. It should be banned. It has these moral and problematic uh, consequences. Let's get it banned. I, I, was, I, I, was, I was wondering if you could uh, enlighten me about what, what, why, why would there be some doctors that, that, that had a, an ax to grind against coffee? It, it, so th there's a lot to speculate on that, but um, there are some scholars who assess this issue. They, they say that... Um, Coffee, when it first emerged, it was deemed to be a type of miracle drug or a type of substance that um, had a, it was a remedy. It was deemed to be a remedy for many illnesses and ailments. And it was actually being prescribed for a whole lot of uh, different problems. It could actually be used as a treatment option. So a lot of people are drinking coffee or using it uh, as a type of medication. Now, if you're a doctor, you are going to see this as a type of threat to your craft. If you're a doctor who's 
whose job is to prescribe medications for mm. ill patients. And you're making medications for these types of uh, ailments. And now you see something being called coffee coming around, which is now getting more freely accessible. And your drugs are no longer in that strong of a demand, then you feel that you're actually under some type of pressure. And it, it, it does become within your interest to actually seek a wholesale ban of it. Now, yeah. this is, of course, one possible reading of it, but it is it does make sense to a large extent. Um, um, it's, it's similar to modern day lobbying by pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Or <laughs> For yeah, so a, all these I'm people. Yeah. Analogy. <laughs> it's an interesting um, uh, alliance between scholars and jurists, uh, sorry, jurists and doctors, all getting together saying, we're going to prep coffee. They get the uh, Meccan governor on their side, uh, hire big, hire big. He then um, gathers all of the jurists in a very hastily, uh, in a very hast hasty fashion. And you see that um, the assembly itself is quite biased. Why is it biased? Because higher big is getting all these jurists together. And basically the whole forum is an opportunity for the prohibitionists to pre present their arguments against coffee. Nowhere in this assembly do we have any documentation which shows that the permitting scholars had a chance to give their own opinions. This is not a neutral forum. Uh, you, you see there, there's a careful investigation reveals that the gathering was not a balanced setting where different perspectives were heard. In fact, it was more, it was just the prohibitionists giving their different arguments. Hmm. Um, I mean, uh, it, at the end of the day, it's, you know, we can't claim to look into anyone's heart, but do you think uh, Khair Big was coming from a genuine place and that he was sincerely convinced that this was an actual, you know, a, a harmful substance and that he just really thought that he was, you know, um, pro prohibiting the vice here, forbidding the vice, and he just wanted to immediately um, outlaw it? Or... Um, or, or, you know, uh, was there some other uh, ulterior motive, uh, in that, uh, I don't know, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not sure, but, uh, but I, I, I would figure that if he, if there was some sort of genuine concern that he would at least want to hear the, what the other side has to say. Yeah, the, that's an, th those are some very interesting, uh, questions. Um, I left them unanswered because yeah, there it is. It would be speculative on my part, but, um, there are scholars who noted that, um, so for like, it, interesting, interesting enough, you, you brought about the moral, the trying to present yourself as a morally conscious ruler. Hire big tried to do that. And he, um, Al Jazeera points out he made a fake story saying that, um, so, so uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna do this in detail, it's actually interesting. Hire big. He he's a Meccan governor. He is the muhtasib. He's the administrator of the city. He is in charge of the markets. He's the supervisor of the markets. He's aware of the ins and outs of the city. Coffee has been in circulation in Mecca by the time Hire Big is in power. You know, we're, we're looking at 1511. Coffee's already been in this city for decades in the, in, the, in the sacred city of Mecca. It's already been around for decades prior, Al Jazeera says. Interestingly enough, Hire Big, when he writes the account of what happened, he says that, oh, he was, he was going on, he was doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And he sees a group of coffee drinkers um, drinking coffee in a way, mimicking wine with these special cups that are used for wine, like goblets. And they are doing the idara, which is a type of passing around the cup, which is in the manner, manner of wine. Very embellished language, very mm -hmm. exaggerated language. And Al Jazeera is saying, this is just a lie. Like, Hire Big is mm -hmm. lying. Al Jazeera says, like, first of all, he says, you're the muhtas about the city. You've been in charge of the city for a long time. Coffee's been around in the markets for a long time. And you're now saying, oh, the first time I'm seeing coffee and people are drinking it in a sinful way in the nearby the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. You're presenting yourself as a very morally conscious ruler who's doing Torah. Why mention that? Like, just reason why are you mentioning this? Um, mm -hmm. And you're now saying that you the, the ruler was alarmed to see people drinking coffee in this manner like wine 
Um, in, well, I guess he wanted he want to sensationalize it by saying, look, yeah. this is even happening in the haram. Like these yeah. people have yeah. no shame, no sense of shame, and yeah. they're they're doing this in the, in the haram itself. Yeah, so he's presenting this in a very sensationalized manner, very embellished manner. And and you know, actually, Al Jazeera says that, yeah, this, he, says, he says this is false because he's you're trying to tell us that after so many years of being the muhtasib, you now notice that there's something called coffee. No, you, you should have noticed this a long time ago before. Mm -hmm. And now you're morally alarmed, you're alarmed. And so now you get the gathering up and you're saying coffee has to be prevalent. Al Jazeera says that's not true. The real true cause is that you had these the, the, the decision was already made before the forum was set. You had this, you know, quote unquote lobbying. You had this jurist doctor alliance. Higher big was set on board. Now, why would higher big want a private coffee then if it's not a moral reason? Well, there's another mechanism that could be brought up. Um, you know, it, it's hard to believe that higher big himself would just agree based on medical reasons, you know, what doctors are saying or jurors are saying. Another possible cause is that. Um, this was, um, Hirebig was a, um, a governor who was um, working under the supervision of the Mamluk Sultanate. And the Mamluk Sultanate was at its nadir. It was near its eclipse. Um, the last of the Sult Mamluk Sultans was in power at this time. And just in a few years, the Mamluk Sultanate would actually uh, disintegrate and it would be conquered. So in this type of... Uh, um, politically very um, tumultuous period. As a governor, you're going to be very cautious of what's happening. And I think one of the things that Higher Big was probably worried about was the coffee house being a site of political dissent or political organization against him. Because this was a political, political tor tor you know, a state of political turmoil, you, your power is not firmly in your hand. Coffee houses are places where people of all types gather together. They can hold political discussions. They can hold anything together. And so for that, it, it does make sense for a ruler to be very suspicious of it because a coffee house could be type of an underground, it, you know, you can say it's for amusement, but it could actually be a place for discussions. Like, you know, you know, if you look at um, the political salons that were happening in the time of uh, just before the French revolution, for instance. Mm, mm. So yeah, something like that could have moved the governor to be on this band Interesting. together. Interesting. Yeah, but this is all speculation. Yeah. Uh, nothing firmly set on stone that could uh, prove this. The only thing to prove though is that Ibn Hajar al-Haythami, Ibn Hajar al-Haythami and Al-Jaziri, they both, um, they both say that Khair Beg was not a morally scrupulous ruler. He was not somebody to be, because he, he you know, um, Al-Jaziri actually cites a few stories of Khair Beg uh, arbitrarily killing people. Um, mm. He was, he, yeah, he was known for his cruelty. So they're saying it's hard for us to believe that a ruler doing these types of things would be so moved by coffee. And of course, the embellished account tells Al Jazeera that I don't believe this. Yeah. So, hello, Adam. <laughs> hello, Adam. <laughs> hello, Adam. Um, but yeah, the, the the other problematic thing is though that if it was a really fair s session, he would have. Um, given the, the permitting view a voice. So what happens in the assembly itself? What happens in the assembly is that the, um, the prohibiting scholars, they get together and they say, well, what is your view on coffee? What should happen with coffee? The jurists who are sitting, they try to strike a balance on this issue. They said coffee by itself, in and of itself, is a permitted substance, but Within the sinful setting of coffee houses, it's prohibited. So they're saying, well, look, we, we prohibit coffee houses. We're against them, but coffee in and of itself, it's an okay substance. It's pure and it's permitted. So they're like, okay, like, well, why don't we just end it here? This is when the prohibitionists, the prohibitionists block. They said, no, 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 we're gonna, we don't want that. We want actually a firm wholesale prohibition of coffee. So, they started presenting some arguments. So the doctors, they were a bunch of, uh, they were two Persian doctors. They, they present some arguments based on medicine. So they were saying that, oh, coffee is a cold and dry substance. Now these are like um, arguments um, informed by, um, this is an outdated medical uh, 
um, perspective. And basically what they mean by cold and dry substances is that they are melancholic, that they, they are harmful to the temperament and they can cause severe depression. Substances mm. that are cold and dry, they were perceived to be harmful to the body because they could cause you um, many long-term problems, um, especially for somebody's mental disposition. Um, I'm not an expert of Galen's medicine, but based on my reading of it, that's what they were saying. Um, that was their argument. Mm. Um, of course, this type of reasoning on its own, it's not satisfactory, this type of Galenic medicine. The reason is because, first of all, coffee is not a cold and dry substance. Al Jazeera talks about that. He's saying it's not cold and dry. He's saying that actually it has, it's different. It's a warm substance. Um, but that's a side point. The more important point is that they're trying to say coffee is harmful because it's cold and dry. Well, the issue is that there are many substances that are cold and dry and we eat them. You know, mm. for example, um, according to Galen's medication, um, this medical um, typology and classification, you have a lot of vegetables and fruits and other substances that are cold and dry. So for example, um, they would say that I think lentils are um, cold and dry. They would say eggplant mm. is cold and dry. These other substances are cold and dry. No scholar prohibited these substances. So why are you bringing this up only on coffee? Um, so this type of argument on itself is quite unsatisfactory. And another further point against it is that um, cold and dry substances can only cause problems if they're taken in a large amount or continuously. If you're going to say coffee is harmful, then it's only harmful if it's consumed in very large amounts. But we've now you've not established though, that drinking coffee in moderation or in small amounts is prohibited. So anything that's consumed in a very large amount is going to be prohibited. Yeah, eventually it's going to be harmful. So they haven't really given a strong argument against coffee with this. This type of argument is not satisfactory. So then um, that argument's problematic. The other argument that they give is witness testimony. So this is a more interesting argument. So what happens is mm -hmm. big and these doctors, they brought a few people and they dressed them up in scholarly clothes and they tried to make them look very good. Although they were all unknown people, Al Jazeera notes, they weren't people of reliable testimony. And they all said that, oh, we drank coffee and we, we used to, we weren't good people. We drank coffee and other things and we found that coffee was just like those other intoxicants. So they were saying that, oh, we can strike a case uh, against coffee with this. Now, what happens is these jurists, most of them sitting down here and listening to this, like we of course don't have much documentation on this, not even Al Jazeera, but it's hard to believe any jurist would listen to this seriously or take these arguments by himself seriously. And Al, Jaz Al Jazeera notes that um, he does give us one important note. He notes that one of the main attending jurists was um, Nuruddin Ali ibn, -Nas Ali ibn Nasser. And he actually, um, what he did was he very neatly sidestepped one of the arguments that were being given. And what he said was that, um, look, you witnesses, you're saying coffee is like wine. So do you guys drink wine or were you drinking wine? And um, they said, yeah, we did. And they, they, they kind of left it open like that. And <laughs> so uh, what happened was Ali bin Nasser, he turned to the governor and he said, you know, if you really want to listen to these people anymore, then I think you should first um, impose the legal punishment on them. Now that, you yeah. know, that these people aren't really reliable, like they're now admitted to us that they've done these types of things. And there's no real evidence that um, they've repented per se. And now you, if, if we're gonna, if you want to listen to them, let's first of all, um, let's first of all um, have them. Play the head. Uh, yeah. The head, yeah. Since they admitted that they had consumed the wine, their testimony could no longer be accepted. So, as Sheikh uh, Ali bin Nasser's um, opposing lines of reasoning, they were very injurious to the prohibitionist cause. And some historians, they do note that. Because of his constant rebuttals, a large number of the attendees were finding his counter arguments to be convincing. So the governor and the prohibitionists, they were failing in their attempts. They weren't really able to get 
this um, their side, anybody on board really. Um, now, when you read the memorandum, the story of this account, and when you read um, how it ends, it ends very quickly and arbitrarily. So you have all these arguments, none of them make sense. And then here's how it closes. You have the two doctors who are talking about cold and dry and everything, that the uh, coffee is cold and dry, and they're, they're being rebutted. What happens is they suddenly just said, well, okay, even if it's pure and it's permissible, it drags you to a sin, to the coffee house. And for that reason, it, the doors to it should be closed. The doctor made that claim? The two doctors are saying, yeah, it's, 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 it, it, the ending of it, <laughs> it, 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 it's very, it's very odd when you read it. Um, even if you keep reading it, it, it sounds even more odd. Uh, it doesn't even make sense when you read it, um, that the doctors are closing the discussion. And then what happens is basically the governor procures the signatures, but yeah, signatures, quote unquote, of all these scholars giving their, you know, blessing of this prohibition. Um, of course, anybody who reads this, and Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera himself says, he says, this is this was these fatwas against coffee that were taken from the Meccan governor, these were through duress. They yeah. feared the governor's wrath. The governor was known for his violence. He was known for his tyranny. He wasn't able to generate a convincing argument that coffee was intrinsically forbidden. So what happened was, at the end, he just had to forcibly get their concurrence for the drinks ban. And he then made the memorandum with the embellished story about the Kaaba and everything. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he then gave a very one-sided discussion of what happened in the assembly. He, he ignored Nur al-Din Ali bin Nasser's name completely. He was, his name was completely taken out. His name was struck out. None of his um, arguments against were taken um, recorded or registered and then what happened was they they sent this to the mamluk sultanate in cairo and the jurists they all reluctantly agreed they gave their written approval of this predetermined decision now what happens then you know higher big he's expecting he's saying look i got all the scholarly backing i um I've been able to convince a generating. This is how he's presenting himself. He's saying, "Look, I'm I am morally moved by this. I am I am religiously conscious. I care about what's happening in the city. I have a responsibility as the muhtasab to take to take care of all these immoral activities going on. Coffee's has problematic properties. All these scholars agree with me. Like anybody who looks at it, they're like, okay, maybe he's got it and he's gonna win. Like he he forced everybody to agree with him. Um, he was able to make this strong." document although it's all false mostly false at least the arguments apparently look good enough so he's probably going to win he's probably going to get the ban uh you know agreed upon the mamluk sultanate will give its approval of this ban but what happens what happens is the mamluk sultan replies back with a royal decree and the royal decree is very fascinating because it actually falsifies almost all of the claims that were being made by Hayerbeg. Hayerbeg was saying coffee is intoxicating, coffee is harmful. He's writing all of these uh, different arguments and he's expecting a wholesale prohibition of coffee. What happens is the Mamluk Sultan's royal decree it only prohibits the consumption of coffee in the coffee houses. It does not prohibit coffee in and of itself. And the royal decree is actually recorded in uh, Al Jazeera's work. So what they're saying is, if you read the quote, what they're basically saying is that we're aware, we've now become aware that coffee is being drunk and, and consumed in a way that wine is being consumed through the idara, the passing around the cup, the use of the goblets, the use of these other things. Okay, we acknowledge that the things you mentioned, okay, those are problematic. We also know that coffee is being used in association with other prohibited activities. Um, and they, the, the more important lines are the last two sentences. They're saying it is evident that even the water of Zamzam will become prohibited if consumed in this manner. <laughs> then let the cons public consumption of coffee and its circulation in the markets be prescribed. These two last sentences, according to Al Jazeera, they are they falsify Khair Bake's claim. What, what what does this mean? It means that 
it's not the what, it's the how. It's mm. not the substance in and of itself that's problematic. It's how it's being consumed that's the problem. So what they're saying mm. is, okay, the world is saying, okay, we we're against how coffee is being consumed, and in or and we note that the major problem is the coffee house. And for that reason, we're just going to ban the public consumption of coffee. Drink it inside your houses. It's okay. Don't drink it outside because when you drink it outside, these other problematic things happen. So as long as you drink it inside your houses, we're okay with that. So Jatiri says, this actually proves that there were other scholars in Cairo, in the royal court or in other places who likely nullified the claim of these the, of higher bake and uh, the false fatwas that he got and they they were able to say that no we're going to strike a balance on this issue we're going to permit it in private ban it in public so at the end what happens is that um scholarly balance is restored again and this if it didn't happen in mecca it happens through cairo so the decree restored balance in the matter by issuing a compromise resolution. Coffee is in and, itself, in and of itself permissible, but it's public consumption in outside quarters. As a matter of caution should be avoided, lest people gather in settings like coffee houses. So Hire Bakes, a uh, very strong campaign against coffee failed. It tremendously backfired because he was now stripped of the authority to harass and punish individuals who drank coffee within the confines of their dwellings. Now, the people of Mecca, they became aware of what the royal decree said, the Marsum, when they became aware. They became aware of it and they said, look, we're aware now that higher Bakes campaign failed and it, they also realized that the decree permits coffee. So they said, look, we're just going to defy this, the, the restrictions altogether. We're going to drink it in public as well. Like, what can mm. he do? Like, Kyer Big lost a lot of his legitimacy because um, it seems that he expended a lot of efforts on banning coffee altogether. And um, now all of his efforts are wasted. So a lot of people were like, this is our chance to get back at him. So they started drinking it in public. And Kyer Big could not really do much. He really was not able to stop them because everybody was now flaunting these regulations because these were very lax regulations. Um, it kind of seems that... Um, the royal decree, when you read of it, read it, it's kind of really saying to Higher Big that we're not very moved by your concerns altogether. The only thing that concerns us is what's happening in the public sphere, but we really are not um, convinced by any of the arguments you've made on the intrinsic properties of coffee itself. And yeah, within some short time, Higher Big is removed from power as well. So the whole thing for him ends as a stupendous failure, a giant mm -hmm. failure. Right. So, um, in closing, the um, what we can um, gather from this presentation is that the coffee controversy or the coffee episode in Islamic history is, contrary to many claims, actually a strong uh, indication of the juristic power, the the juristic uh, genius found in the ulama stratum that the ulama stratum was not a naive class that um, was just sitting in an they were sitting on their armchairs and just looking at oh coffee lexically means wine it's prohibited or coffee should just be permitted because of a uh, because of the original ruling of permissibility they were not like that they were actually very active um, they brought in a, a number of empirical and um, you might even say scientific principles in place in order to strike a um, very accurate ruling of coffee. Um, it's a very impressive case study because it shows to us that um, jurists can put on many hats on. They can put on hats on as uh, scientists. They can put on a hat as uh, scholars of epistemology, scholars of logic. They were able to look at things through a number of different lenses. They were looking at it um, through a bird's eye view. They were not looking at coffee just as a um, intrinsic or its own uh, properties per se. They were also looking at it at the social sphere as well. So they were giving balanced rulings. These all really, when we look at them at a whole, 
we make two major findings. The, the first major finding is that um, there are strong indicators which point to the conclusion that the majority of jurors permitted coffee. And the second point is that the Meccan assembly, contrary to many uh, academics, does not prove that the majority of scholars were prohibitionists. So these, in sum, uh, give a very strong alternative thesis, which I hope uh, to some extent can challenge the mainstream thesis and uh, put it into question. Well, Zakal uh, Khairan, the sort for this, uh, you know, very interesting and educational presentation. Um, uh, it, it was long overdue for this issue to have received a proper clarification of this sort that is, you know, accessible to the wider public. Um, I know for sure that modernists have long twisted this issue in order to undermine the credibility of Islamic scholarship and present traditional Islamic scholars as being collectively backward and inept to the point that they cannot adapt quickly enough to our changing times. And it's also clear from reading your article um, that unfortunately even some popular traditional Muslim speakers who ought to know better have fallen victim to this distorted narrative and um, in turn it inadvertently undermine the credibility of traditional Islamic scholarship by further spreading this false narrative. So, you know, thank you once again for setting the record straight on this issue and and thank you for, for the excellent exposition of the um, various uh, stances held by the different jurists uh, of that time. Um, it's, it's very interesting to, and insightful to, to understand and see the wide ranging perspectives the scholars held. Um, it is um, especially important to know, as you clearly demonstrated, how, how, how dependent a fatwa is upon the manner and and contents of the question posed to the mufti as uh, this undoubtedly um, shapes the answer that will be provided to the questioner. Um, uh, I, I did want to ask, um, you, you, you mentioned that, you know, the conventional wisdom or, or the mainstream view um, uh, uh, in perhaps uh, Western academia, uh, for instance, is, uh, was that the prohibitionist view was the majoritarian view. And, and clearly you demonstrated that this is an insufficient um, assessment of this historical event. What, what possible reasons could explain that, you know, insufficiency? Like what were, were, were all these scholars and academics just failing to do, um, to engage in a proper inductive, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, engagement and 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 reading of all the of all the sources at that time. I mean, do you have any theories that could explain why they have you know why so many have reached that false conclusion? Um. So um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, what I can only offer are some uh, possible uh, hypotheses um, in terms of um, you know non-Muslim academics or uh, non-Muslim scholars. Um, I think um, it might be a type of um, a bias in the sense that um, when they look at this time of history, they are already perceiving the Muslim world to be in decline. They believe that there is a type of intellectual decline. Um, and of course, these types of accounts and episodes, when you look at these uh, apparent fatwas of prohibition, they can very conveniently be employed to support the uh, closing of the gates of Ijtihad thesis, that they're going to be like, look, um, the scholars at the scholarly stratum at this point was so backwards that at this point they are, um, they are simply annexing coffee with wine just based on a lexical uh, connection. They're that, um, they are that naive. I mean, that is the, that is the type of the impression I get from some uh, writings on this topic that um, co scholars at this point of time, there is a lack of uh, creativity and independent thinking, independent juristic thinking, which demonstrates that scholars were just very lazily um, giving a convenient answer on coffee. And they're just saying, oh, coffee comes from kahwa, kahwa means wine, we're just going to prohibit it. And uh, they can use that and employ that um, to support their theses whether it's um, uh, 
um, the static view of the Muslim world. The Muslim world is static and cannot change. It's not adaptable to any type of uh, uh, improvement or change, or it can be used for the closing of the gates of Ijtihad. So the, it's very convenient um, for them to use that. Um, I'm not saying they're maliciously or intentionally doing it, yeah. but I'm saying if you already believe this wider, broad ranging thesis that at this time, uh, the Muslim world is beset with these problems, then um, this type of account um, can very conveniently fit in um, yeah. if you don't look one, at one it. One would be predisposed to yes. being receptive to that theory. Yes. Um, in terms of Muslim scholars, um, I would say that um, um, the main reason why they would cite this episode is they want to bring it up as a... Uh, in a very sensationalist, sensationalist way, they want to bring it up as an example of um, the retrograde tendencies of many traditional scholars, traditional scholarship, and they want to use that to um, promote their own reformist projects. So they can use this as a type of um, project to justify their own itch to hat. So they're going to be saying that um, we are in need of new, a new type of itch to hat. And the reason is that these recent episodes, relatively recent episodes, demonstrate that Muslim scholarship had lost its empirical footing, its, its theoretical footing. It is not able to adapt and uh, react properly to Nawazal. So we need a new type of reform. And it's a very convenient way to, um, unfortunately, it's a way of putting scholars down to raise yourself up. Um, that is how I see that when I see some um, speakers doing using it. It's for that type of a tendency. Um, and I think um, I would I would uh, say, however, that um, from the two groups, I would say that the um, I find non-Muslim academics to be more honest and academic in their approach. They are more accurate in their approach. Like, for example, Ralph Hattix, uh might be mispronouncing his last name. Ralph Hatex, um, he has a work called Coffee and Coffee Houses. Um, it is one of the main works that was written like 40 something years ago um, on coffee. And um, it, it, although it is lacking in many places, I find that he is at least very accurate in trying to um, pres present some divergent uh, perspectives. He's trying to bring in some of the uh, um, different scholarly positions in coffee. Although he's not able to do it in a very neat fashion, he is able to at least show the different perspectives. It's 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 kind of somewhat baffling to find um, many of the Muslim uh, presenters not uh, showing that degree of um, sophistication and show, presenting the detail, presenting the uh, diversity of legal views in the way that Ralph Hattex did. Um, so I, I find that a bit odd, uh, mm. to be honest. To wrap up this discussion, uh, Ms. Oud, um what general key learnings would you personally like to see Muslims um, derive out of this entire discussion, out of this entire issue? Um, I think the main, uh, the main, uh, one of the main issues that I've um, derive from this point is that um, there are, you should always be wary of secondary sources and always rely on primary sources. If there, if you rely on secondary accounts, they are very prone to error. Um, they might have been subject to malicious or unintentional changes, which uh, alter the account. And so, for example, some of these fatwas of prohibitionists, if you find them in secondary sources, they're sometimes written in a different way or they're, um, the question is not provided with them. So, of course, when you read the, the prohibiting answer, you kind of think that it's absolute. So um, I would say the most important thing is always read primary sources. Do not um, look just at... Um, uh, secondary sources. I think another thing uh, important to note is that um, we should not be ashamed of our tradition. We should not be ashamed of our scholars, or we should not try to um, sensationalize or make up accounts against them to bring ourselves up. And it's unfortunate that some uh, sometimes that happens. Um, if somebody wants to speak 
about a generation or two generations of scholars, of, of Muslim scholarship. I honestly would expect that person to at least uh, read several primary sources carefully. If they're not doing that, and they're just bringing up secondary accounts to give a negative impression of scholars to um, bring put their position down, then um, I find that very disturbing, to be honest. Um, it's very disturbing to see that happen because um, that person does not show their due diligence. Um, and unfortunately, this is, it, you know, you see countless of examples of this being brought up, um, not only this, um, other cases as well, um, other issues as well. Um, but, um, you know, they deserve our respect and they deserve at least um, to be cited correctly and they deserve to be read correctly and they deserve to, um, they deserve at least a fair hearing, I would say. Um, that's true. I mean, that's the, that's the least we can do for whom the Prophet said I'm described as the inheritors of the prophets. So and yep. so, um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, I think I think that's a great place to end. Uh, I really want to thank you for your time again, uh, This was a, really a fascinating uh, presentation, and uh, you know we'd love to have you uh, on Blogging Theology again. And um, I want you, to thank uh, the listeners. And uh, and you know with that we conclude. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum